Hi, I'm Barbara Norquist. I'm a gynecologic oncologist at the University of Washington. And uh, I want to thank Sue uh, Friedman for inviting me to this meeting to discuss what's new in gyne cancer screening and prevention. And then for full disclosure, I see patients in our multidisciplinary breast and ovarian cancer prevention program uh, in Seattle. And I am also a surgeon who performs uh, risk reduction surgeries. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, these are the topics I'm planning to cover in this uh, short period of time. The basics of gyne cancer prevention, uh, ovarian cancer screening, what we know and what we don't know. And I wanted to discuss interval salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy, as that is an option that people are increasingly interested in. So first, the basics. Why are some women at increased risk of gynecologic cancer? The, um, one of the main uh, reasons is from inherited mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Inherited mutations in genes associated with endometrial cancer risk, such as uh, the genes uh, that contribute to Lynch syndrome, as well as Cowden syndrome. Of course, patients with Lynch syndrome also have an increased risk of ovarian cancer. With uh, gene panel testing, we're increasingly recognizing uh, patients with mutations in other genes uh, that are also associated with the risk of ovarian cancer, such as RAD51C, RAD51D, uh, RIP1, and PALP2. Some patients have a strong family history of ovarian cancer, but we can't identify a mutation in the family. And those are kind of a special case that I'm not necessarily discussing during this talk, but I didn't want to leave them out uh, completely. So what are the risks of developing breast and ovarian cancer in patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations? And um, for this whole talk, when I say ovarian cancer, I'm lumping together ovarian, fallopian tube, and primary peritoneal cancer. And this was from a pretty recent study that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2017, where um, uh, they have followed uh, patients with BRCA mutations long-term uh, to establish risks of cancer. And the breast uh, cancer risks are in this graph on the left. And then the graph on the right, which is where my focus is, is on the risk of ovarian cancer with BRCA1 carriers having a 44% risk uh, by the age of 80 and BRCA2 carriers having an approximately 17% risk by the age of 80. Lynch syndrome, I mentioned briefly before, and this is a syndrome with uh, risks of colon cancer as well as other GI cancers that I don't list here. Uh, endometrial cancer and often ovarian cancer. And these genes have different risk profiles depending on uh, the mutated gene. And I leave this uh, table in here mainly uh, for reference. So what steps can a woman take uh, to manage uh, her gyne cancer risk? Uh, so first, uh, knowledge is power. There's a reason um, this cliche does have some rooting in the truth, uh, because understanding the risk, understanding the considerations of timing, and making connections with a team um, can help uh, people develop a personalized cancer prevention plan. Chemo prevention uh, is a term that indicates taking a medication uh, to reduce cancer risk. Birth control pills uh, or combined oral contraceptives are a main um, medication that can reduce the risk of ovarian cancer and likely also endometrial cancer. And uh, tamoxifen and other uh, estrogen receptor uh, blocking drugs are also used to help reduce breast cancer risk for some patients at increased risk of breast cancer. For gynecologic cancer, really our gold standard for uh, cancer prevention is actually surgery. And I will go into that uh, in a moment. I also wanted to mention what the most common symptoms are of gynecologic cancer. For ovarian cancer, 
This can have a very wide range of symptoms, ranging from pretty minimal to pretty severe. And these symptoms can sometimes mimic other conditions that are common in patients. Um, but the body of uh, literature supports that these are the most common symptoms. Uh, persistent abdominal bloating and not like the kind of bloating people get here and there, um, but it's uh, staying and getting worse abdominal or pelvic pain with kind of a similar characteristic to the bloating. It's not just an intermittent um, pain, it's a persistent or progressive pain. Urinary frequency is a common symptom in many female patients, but uh, is often uh, reported by patients with a diagnosis of ovarian cancer and getting full quickly, uh, which is also called early satiety, uh, can also be a symptom to have evaluated. For patients who are at risk of endometrial cancer, the main uh, symptom here is really any change in menstrual bleeding. In patients who have not yet gone through menopause, so still having regular periods, a change in their cycle or bleeding in between periods uh, is a sign uh, that should trigger an evaluation. And in patients who are menopausal, meaning they are no longer having periods, they should not have resumption of bleeding and any postmenopausal bleeding uh, should be evaluated by a gynecologist to rule out um, an endometrial cancer. I wanted to talk through some of the different types of surgery that patients undergo. And on the right is just kind of a basic diagram of the female reproductive anatomy with the uterus, ovaries, fallopian tubes, and uh, vagina. Uh, the cervix is really uh, part of the uterus. Uh, you can sort of try to draw an arbitrary line uh, to separate it from the uterus, but we tend to think of it as one organ. Bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, or uh, what the surgeon will often call a BSO because it's clunky to say bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, uh, is removal of the fallopian tubes and ovaries. RRSO stands for risk-reducing salpingo ophorectomy, which is just another way of saying uh, the BSO. A salpingectomy is removal of the fallopian tubes alone, and hysterectomy refers to removal of the uterus. The preferred method for risk reduction surgery is laparoscopy uh, or robotic surgery, which is just a fancy way of doing laparoscopy. This is a surgical method employing multiple small incisions, and you'll often hear this called minimally invasive surgery. Uh, because of the small incisions, this allows patients to recover uh, more quickly and have a shorter period of time in the hospital. Uh, the term laparotomy means surgery through a single larger incision. This is often also called open surgery. Uh, I drew this pink line here to kind of show like a, a C-section style incision, and then sometimes an up and down incision might be employed. This is typically not a method I would ever use for risk reduction uh, because there's a longer recovery and more complications, but there could be um, some specific reasons why that might be suggested, uh, but should raise uh, some skepticism if everything else is normal. Also uh, vaginal surgery, is an excellent way to remove the uterus, uh, but I do not recommend it for risk reduction uh, if there's a risk of ovarian cancer because uh, it is sometimes difficult to completely remove the ovaries and you don't have the opportunity to survey the abdomen and look around at the abdominal cavity. So really uh, laparoscopy is the preferred method. So what do the guidelines say for prevention? Uh, for patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations who do not have cancer. Uh, so the NCCN recommends uh, risk-reducing salpingo ophorectomy or removal of the tubes and ovaries between the ages of 35 to 40 for BRCA1 carriers and between the ages of 40 to 45 uh, for BRCA2 carriers. And there's the source uh, listed there. NCCN is often the go-to guidelines um, for uh, most um, oncology providers. 
why are the ages different for BRCA1 and BRCA2? That is based on the average age at which um, patients develop ovarian cancer that's related to those inherited mutations. So um, this is just a graph uh, showing the average age at diagnosis for patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations and those with no mutations. And this green line are the BRCA1 carriers and they truly have an earlier onset of ovarian cancer when they do develop that uh, with a median age of about 50 and uh, risk starts to go up. Like this is a line drawn at age 40. And you can see that this green line is already going up uh, prior to the age of 40. Uh, so these patients do have earlier onset um, cancers. BRCA2 carriers actually have kind of the same risk as patients who don't have a mutation in terms of the, sorry, the same age of diagnosis as patients who don't have a mutation, their average is about 60. Um, so that's just why those guidelines are different uh, for the different genes. Bilateral salpingoophrectomy or RRSO, sorry for using uh, the different terms, uh, reduces uh, all-cause mortality by 77%. Uh, predominantly by reducing um, the incidence of ovarian cancer, and it's very highly effective uh, for cancer prevention. For um, BRCA2 carriers, if done prior to the age of 45, it may decrease uh, the breast cancer risk. This is somewhat um, controversial, and uh, we don't know the full story there. Another decision uh, that patients pursuing risk reduction surgery might make is considering the pros and cons of hysterectomy at the time of the risk reducing removal of the tubes and ovaries. And there are various uh, pros and cons to this approach. This is often you know, a 30 minute conversation that I would have in the office. So we don't have a ton of time to talk about it here, but essentially the pros are um, simpler and potentially safer hormone replacement therapy if the patient is a, is a candidate for hormone replacement therapy, because if you've had a hysterectomy, you can take estrogen alone. And if you have a uterus, you have to combine that estrogen with progesterone. And some studies indicate a possible increased risk of breast cancer with the combined hormone replacement therapy, but not with estrogen alone. If the patient already has problems with their uterus and was wanting a hysterectomy for other reasons, then this is an opportunity. And um, uh, also if there's concern for risk of endometrial cancer, then removing the uterus will prevent that risk. Uh, but this is a uh, riskier and longer uh, recovery surgery. It is not the critical structure to remove to impact ovarian cancer risk, and then it also removes uh, the possibility of childbearing. There was a study that came out fairly recently indicating that BRCA1 carriers in particular may have an increased risk of endometrial cancer, in particular um, higher grade endometrial cancers, which could be potentially harder to treat uh, than standard endometrial cancers. Uh, and that risk is estimated to be somewhere around two to 4% um, lifetime risk, but this is pretty uncertain. And this is something I discuss with patients ahead of time, uh, but this degree of risk um, for many does not quite reach the, reach the threshold at which they uh, desire hysterectomy. Uh, but this is a very uh, individual decision and should be approached as such. What do the NCCN guidelines say for prevention with mutations in other genes? So for other homologous recombination uh, genes, such as RIP1, RAD51C, and RAD51D, the NCCN guidelines recently added these other genes into a category of consider risk-reducing salpingoophrectomy between the ages of 45 to 50. And these are genes that are estimated to have a greater than 10% risk of ovarian cancer. For Lynch syndrome, um, you might recall from that earlier slide that there are different uh, risks for different genes. Hysterectomy uh, can be considered uh, for any patient with Lynch syndrome due to their risk of endometrial cancer and removal of tubes and ovaries should be individualized and uh, there's insufficient evidence uh, for MSH6 and PMS2.
Uh, but again, this is a highly uh, individual uh, counseling for each patient um, who is making these decisions. I wanted to make a special mention of the gene uh, PALB2. Uh, there are multiple studies, including research from, from UW, that indicates a risk, a link between PALB2 and ovarian cancer risk. And then two fairly large studies that came out uh, in just the last couple of years estimated the risk to be three to 5% up to age 80, um, which is increased over the population risk. Based on uh, these studies, uh, the American College of Medical Genetics did release guidelines for PALB2 and suggested consideration of risk-reducing cell pingoophorectomy with uh, what they call non-directive counseling at or beyond the age of menopause. Uh, the reason that that age is chosen is to avoid harm uh, for, from oophorectomy related to premature menopause, uh, which uh, can cause significant health concerns if done at too young of an age. So waiting until menopause helps uh, to make this safer. So what are the main principles of risk reduction surgery? Um, while you're reducing risk, you wanna make sure you're not taking any undue risks. Uh, so this is kind of getting back to uh, the right uh, type of surgery and doing um, only um, what is necessary and what the patient is enthusiastic to do. And uh, surgery should be done minimally invasively as the default to allow for a quicker recovery, a lower risk of complications, and uh, the ability to survey the abdomen. Uh, the minimal procedure is an assessment of the, of the abdomen, as I mentioned, that's just looking around with the laparoscopic camera, uh, collection of pelvic washings, and removal of the entire uh, fallopian tube and ovary. Counseling about the hormonal impact and how it will be managed is a critical step before surgery and should be discussed as part of the um, uh, consent process for surgery. A word about hormone replacement therapy. So is this recommended for premenopausal uh, mutation carriers who've undergone removal of their ovaries? If they do not have a personal history of breast cancer, uh, the NCCN, uh, which is typically the most conservative of these bodies, uh, says discuss possible short-term hormone replacement therapy. The North American Menopause Society is a bit stronger. Uh, they say on the basis of observational studies, consider offering systemic hormone therapy until the median age of menopause around uh, 52. And the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists state that women who are unaffected by breast cancer should be offered hormone replacement therapy to mitigate the effects of early menopause. And I do um, routinely recommend hormone replacement therapy to patients who are premenopausal and undergoing removal of the ovaries uh, if they do not have a personal history of an estrogen receptor positive uh, breast cancer. And that means them, not uh, their family. Oftentimes uh, patients have family members who've had breast cancer and that makes them nervous about hormone re replacement therapy, but that is not considered a contraindication. Other considerations, uh, the pathology is very important. Uh, patients can have microscopic cancers in the fallopian tube and you cannot necessarily see those with the naked eye. And so the pathologist has to do a proper protocol uh, to section the entire fallopian tube and ovary. Many patients participate in research studies as part of these surgeries. Uh, and so if that's important uh, to you, you might wanna find a center where that's an option. Uh, the surgeon should ideally understand uh, the genetics and so that they know how to counsel you and also having at least immediately available the expertise to handle malignancy if encountered as that does happen from time to time during risk reduction surgeries. So that was the basics. Um, I'll now move into a bit about ovarian cancer screening, what we know and uh, what we don't know. So part of the of the issue with ovarian cancer is that a lot of ovarian cancer develops first as a microscopic lesion, often in the fallopian tube. Uh, this is a microscopic photo of such a cancer. The current tools that we have, 
which are predominantly uh, pelvic ultrasound and a CA-125 blood test, they often cannot detect lesions that are this size. Early stage disease is associated with better outcomes, but often the stage of the ovarian cancer may be more related to the biology than it is to our uh, speed at detecting it, meaning uh, that they can spread um, fairly early in the disease course. A screening test should hopefully be able to identify a precursor to a cancer that can be successfully treated. And in the case of ovarian cancer screening, we actually cannot identify the precursor. Uh, the best we can do is, is earlier detection. So there have been a couple of trials looking at ovarian cancer uh, screening in just the general population. So these are not patients who are known to be at an increased risk of um, ovarian cancer, but just um, post-menopausal uh, uh, female patients. So there was the PLCO trial in um, the United States and then the UK collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening, uh, which is also commonly called the UKC TOX uh, study. These studies enrolled large uh, numbers of patients and basically we're testing various combinations of ultrasound and CA-125 versus just uh, routine care. Uh, unfortunately, none of these uh, studies was able to identify a significant difference in ovarian cancer mortality. There was possibly a suggestion of decreased stage at the time of diagnosis, but unfortunately this didn't translate to people living longer. And so um, various society guidelines have suggested that we not offer screening to the general population because it's not effective. There have been a few studies of uh, patients who are known to be at increased risk of ovarian cancer. The most notable of these studies is probably the UK uh, FOX study, uh, which looked at patients with a greater than 10% lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. They had a CA-125 blood test every four months and then a transvaginal ultrasound if those numbers were abnormal based on an algorithm. Uh, they identified 19 cancers in this study population of 4,500 women. Um, 162 screens were what they called positive. Uh, 13 of those patients had ovarian cancer, and so that's 149 surgeries for false positive tests. Um, quite a few of those uh, cases were stage one to two, and, and most had a complete resection, uh, but relatively small uh, numbers here. And for this reason, this is why I typically recommend screening to patients who are willing to have an operation uh, because of this risk of uh, false positives. And so um, who should get ovarian cancer screening in its current form? Uh, so normal risk women, no. Uh, patients who are at increased risk, such as BRCA1 and, and two carriers, um, I do offer those patients um, testing with CA125 and uh, ultrasound as a bridge uh, to future surgery. And it is definitely not an acceptable substitute uh, for risk reduction surgery. Um, molecular methods could be a way to do this better. And I'll talk to you a little bit about a study uh, that we're doing uh, to look at that. Um, and then just for a moment, I wanted to explain why other diseases are more amenable to screening. And it mostly has to do with that ability to find uh, a pre-cancer and treat it before it becomes a problem. So uh, colon cancer screening is incredibly effective uh, because colonoscopy can find uh, polyps that can be removed before they become malignant. Uh, for cervical cancer, uh, the pap smear, can find abnormal cells that can be treated before they become uh, malignant. And uh, with breast cancer, there's very clear evidence that um, early detection with screening improves uh, survival. Uh, so I don't mean to be down on screening in general, just that our current methods of screening for ovarian cancer have been uh, disappointing when compared to other disease sites. Other approaches to early detection or screening include uh, molecular testing through pap smears, uh, tampons, or even uh, something called uterine lavage, which is a kind of a saline wash of the uterine cavity, uh, looking for uh, tumor-derived uh, changes in DNA uh, that can be picked up with sensitive sequencing techniques. 
We have been um, collecting uterine lavages in patients with suspected ovarian cancer undergoing surgery um, and are looking for p53 mutations that uh, are unique to the tumor. And so um, hopefully results will be available uh, from this study soon, uh, probably quite some time before this type of method is ready for prime time. Uh, but there are multiple research teams working on different methods of molecular detection. So I am hopeful that in uh, the next um, several years, we should hopefully have um, better methods of detection. Uh, so now to switch gears and talk about interval salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy, because this is um, a hot topic. So there are many reasons that people delay ovarian removal. Uh, removal of the ovaries prematurely can increase all-cause mortality, uh, predominantly due to um, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we can mitigate many consequences of surgical menopause with hormone replacement therapy, um, but we can't you know, perfectly recreate what the ovary does. Uh, so there are multiple factors to consider. If uh, patients are done with childbearing, uh, what gene is mutated and what is the um, typical age of onset of the cancers that we're trying to predict and what does the family history look like. And essentially, we're trying to keep the ovaries as long as possible because they do good things, uh, but then remove them before they can cause a risk um, to the patient. And so that's a delicate balance which they try to strike uh, with the guidelines. The um, tubal hypothesis is that a majority of serous ovarian and peritoneal cancers are actually seeded uh, from cells in the fallopian tube. And this may even be particularly relevant for patients with BRCA mutations. So why not just remove the fallopian tubes? Um, this likely does reduce risk substantially, but we are currently unable to quantify how much we're reducing that risk. Uh, but it does allow patients to keep their hormonal function and it also is a sterilization procedure. So if patients uh, do not wish to be able to become pregnant, then this is an option for uh, permanent sterilization. The main downsides are that, again, the risk of uh, the degree of risk reduction can't be estimated. Um, you may miss out on the potential for breast cancer risk reduction with oophorectomy. Uh, we do still recommend completion oophorectomy. So that's two surgeries instead of one. And um, it is a sterilization procedure. So that's either a pro or a con, depending on where you are in your life. Uh, we also, part of the reason we don't understand the risk profile of this procedure precisely is because we don't know when those concerning cells transfer from the fallopian tube to the ovary. And um, this is a slide that I got from Dr. Um, Kara Long Roche at Memorial Sloan Kettering showing a little piece of fallopian tube epithelium on the surface of the ovary. And this is all normal tissues, but we just don't know how often that's happening or how to prevent that. Um, so the WISP study was concluded a while back. Uh, this stands for Women Choosing Surgical Prevention. This study enrolled uh, premenopausal women between the ages of 30 to 50 who had mutations in genes uh, that led to an increased risk of ovarian cancer. And patients chose their own study arm, either interval salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy or risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy. Um, Primary outcome of this study was sexual function uh, and, and then also vasomotor symptoms, uh, psychological symptoms, and um, the pathologic results to see if there were any interval cancers. These are some of the results that have been pre presented publicly that I can show you. Uh, the age of patients choosing salpingectomy was younger than those having oophorectomy. And patients having um, salpingectomy were also more likely to have risk-reducing mastectomy. Uh, not quite sure why. Uh, this is the uh, cancer risk distress scale, looking at um, how worried patients were about uh, developing cancer with uh, relatively high uh, scores at baseline and then decreased scores uh, six months after surgery. So both arms, either if they had salpingectomy or removal of, of both tubes and ovaries, uh, had a reduction in their uh, concern about developing cancer uh, with no difference between the arms. Uh, there was more regret 
in the arm uh, that had oophorectomy. 75% of this group got hormone replacement therapy, uh, but those in the self-injectomy arm did have a higher quality of life and less menopausal symptoms. That's even with HRT. Uh, it's important to note this study was not powered uh, for cancer outcomes, uh, and that should hopefully be published uh, soon. Now enter the SOROC trial, which is being run through the NRG, which is a national clinical trial organization. And these are the uh, investigators here. And this, um, uh, this barcode uh, will take you to the FORCE uh, website link uh, for this study. The primary objective of the SOROC study is to compare the non-inferiority of bilateral salpingectomy, so removal of just tubes, with delayed oophorectomy when compared to bilateral salpingo oophorectomy to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer amongst uh, women with BRCA1 mutation. So this study is only for BRCA1 carriers and is open nationally. Um, and just to reword uh, that uh, objective is just, is this procedure safe? Uh, so this study is actually aiming to answer that. To enroll in the study, you have to be between the ages of 35 to 50 with a BRCA1 mutation, be planning to undergo risk reduction surgery, be premenopausal, have at least one ovary and one fallopian tube, um, and have a report indicating a pathogenic mutation. Patients with other cancers who've had chemotherapy or hormonal therapy uh, or uh, radiotherapy to the abdomen or pelvis are not a candidate for this study. A prior history of ovarian cancer, uh, patients who are too um, medically ill to have surgery, and patients with abnormal screening tests that are suspicious for ovarian cancer. So final take home points, uh, the mainstay of gynecologic cancer prevention is surgery. Uh, surgery should be minimally invasive and appropriately timed. Uh, based on the individual patient's needs and circumstances. And finally, interval salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy is currently being explored in clinical trials. So sorry, I know I went a couple minutes over. Uh, ovarian cancer screening with ultrasound and CA125 is not terribly effective, unfortunately, and is not a substitute for surgery, uh, but can act as a bridge to surgery, and hopefully we'll have better methods uh, in the future. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm glad you could join us today.